what I'm talking about here picks up on some of the themes that we have been discussing over the last two or three days. Um, it certainly picks up on Jane's uh, allusion, well, both Jane's, but Jane's, uh, Jane Kenway's, sorry, I'll try that again, Jane Knight's, we've got two Jane K's here, um, Jane Knight's allusion to regionalism uh, yesterday in particular, but it also um, raises issues of identity, um, including diaspora identity, <coughs> Um, and to some extent the issue that Jane talked about of, of methodological nationalism and some of the limits of that um, approach. Um, and so it's situated in a very different part of the world and since we are among geographers it, we need to have a map. Um, so in particular as you can see here China's, and I'll talk more about this, you can see China's borders um, in fact impinge on a number of Southeast Asian states, now, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nation uh, member states. And I'll come back to that and the implications of that as we go through. Um, one of the most common ways of thinking about China's rise, unfortunately, is simply to dismiss it or, uh, or to reduce it to uh, economics. And there's no doubt that that's important. I'm arguing here that particularly in this context of China-ASEAN relationships, it's far too narrow a perspective. Um, it doesn't really get us far enough. Um, it's just simply to narrow. In fact, the relationship, and I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through, the relationship is far more complex um, and much longer historically. So we need to think about history, culture, and the interplay of cultures, language, security alliances, and the Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia, all of which are important elements in this relationship. Nonetheless, having said that, um, we do need to pay uh, attention to how China-ASEAN economic relationships are evolving and the uh, growth of them. You will remember, at least some of you will remember, the uh, regional financial crisis of East Asia of the late 1990s, which devastated many of the regional economies, at least in the shorter term. So one of the lesser known features of that event was China's financial assistance to several of its neighbours, quite major packages um, to uh, make available aid and, and uh, loans and so on. And again, after the devastating 2004 tsunami um, that impacted Indonesia, Aceh in particular, um, terribly, again, China was very helpful and that helped um, with its perception in ASEAN, which has not always been a simple one. We also have now a China-ASEAN free trade agreement, free trade area, um, signed in 2010, um, and now increasingly in beginning to embrace service sector trade, not just trade in goods and, and products. Um, there's also some other framework agreements like the air transport agreement and so on. But the kind of areas that we're interested in uh, include higher education, but also things like tourism and finance and so on. And if we look at some of the flows that, that um, Jane was talking about, this Jane, um, you see here that tourism is actually one of those very major flows, as you can see here, uh, of top 10 destinations for mainland Chinese tourists. Four of them are ASEAN member states, Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam. And the flow in the other direction is also substantial, something like 5 million ASEAN tourists visiting China in 2008. Um, that rising service sector trade is also, interestingly, spurring regional demand for Chinese language. Again, an education service. Um, this includes, of course, the uh, dramatic growth of Confucius Institutes, um, in this case within ASEAN, and depending on which source you look at, um, it's between 25 and 30, some of them 
uh, haven't uh, survived. But it's quite impressive to see something like 25 or 30 Confucius Institutes even within this uh, geographically bounded space. Um, and you see the numbers there. Um, seven in Indonesia, more than that probably in Thailand, but Philippines, Malaysia, Myan even Myanmar for heaven's sake, and um, one in Singapore, Cambodia and Laos. So if we look at trade flows, you see here um, that ASEAN's trade with China outgrew that of Japan in 2011. Um, so you see there um, that the EU is still China's um, largest partner, um, US second, and then uh, ASEAN. And you can see how spectacularly it's grown over the last 20 or more years. But the fact that China ASEAN trade is actually growing at a rate faster than those other two means that it's likely that over coming years, and there are some elements we need to take into account that, that um, condition that relationship, it's likely that um, China ASEAN trade may well outstrip the, with those other two uh, partners. What's behind that? Well, in part, of course, geographic proximity and to some extent economic complementarities. And I don't have time to go into that, but the, it, complementarities are an important underpinning of China ASEAN trade. Um, China's investing heavily in the energy sector in Southeast Asia, Indonesia's oil and gas industry, uh, an oil and gas pipeline to connect Myanmar to Yunnan, which is one of China's border provinces with Vietnam and so on. Um, and um, yeah, there's, that's a complex relation to relationship in fact, um, as for reasons I'll point out in a minute. Um, and then there are um, states in, in other um, ASEAN states, particularly in relation to energy, which is a big demand in China. Um, there is this in turn, however, poses something of a risk to the more resource-based economies in the region, um, both Indonesia and probably Myanmar which is also heavily resource-based, but of course only emerging from five decades of uh, authoritarian rule. Um, a shift towards service sector trade can mitigate some of those issues. Um, the former Premier Wen Jiabao, in his 2012 government work report, um, stressed further growth in outbound uh, direct investment, particularly in service sectors. Um, and there's a nice little image of China shopping for um, energy um, in, in Southeast Asia. So you see here how uh, substantial that growth has been in China ASEAN trade from uh, basically the last 20 years or so. So we have to deal then as part of this um, understanding with what it means to be good neighbours. There's been a lot of discussion over the last decade or so within China, but also by China scholars, of what China's peaceful rise actually means. It's been certainly a major motif amongst Chinese leaders over the past decade or so since it was elaborated by former President Hu Jintao in uh, uh, about 2005, the early 2000s. Um, and there are some key Chinese diplomatic concepts that try and enshrine um, that notion. Yi Lin Wei Ban, Yi Lin Wei Shan, which means basically maintaining um, good neighborly relations, and the uh, three neighbors policy, San Lin, which is Mu Lin, An Lin, Fu Lin, to be harmonious, to, to be pacific, and to enrich one's neighbors. Um, Importantly, this has a component of strengthening cultural exchanges. Um, obviously, the most obvious example is of the, those Confucius Institutes that I talked about before, um, but there are other elements to it as well. However, at the same time, as we see in the media, most particularly in the last couple of years, that growth in economic and cultural ties, including specifically in higher education, which is what, we, what I'm focusing on here, is set against um, significant growth in territorial disputes, particularly in our case, this particular instance, 
the South China Sea, so several uh, ASEAN member states. As we saw in the map, and I won't go back to it, China's southern border is covered by Vietnam, Myanmar, the Americans still call it Burma often, Laos, um, and then there are sea borders to be taken into account as well. As anyone who's been following any of this will know, there, China is currently in dispute with Vietnam, most spectacularly with Vietnam, including very recently, and I was thinking of that when Jane was talking about ways in which Vietnamese students interact with Chinese students, in whether it's Australia or anywhere else. There are some interesting issues there. Um, also in dispute with the Philippines and the South China Sea and has raised the prospect of declaring an ADIZ there and there's been some moves um, recently to um, lower the tensions and, and come up with a, a, a kind of modus operandi to solve some of those disputes. Vietnam passed a law asserting its sovereignty over the what we call the Paracel and Spratly Islands, Nan Sha Xi Sha in Chinese. Um, that was heavily criticised by China, who sees that as part of their historical uh, um, uh, sovereignty, um, and Philippines' resistance over the Scarborough Shoal, again in Chinese called Huang Yan. Um, perversely, from China's point of view, these um, rather assertive uh, foreign diplomacy efforts may be having the exact opposite effect to the one that they would like, in the sense that it is pushing Vietnam, for example, um, to talk to some of its neighbours, including India, but also to talk to the US um, about um, regional security alliances. Um, a number of Southeast Asian states are now, the Philippines, for example, is now talking about reopening a military base that was closed um, some years ago. Um, but it's complicated. ASEAN member states, if you look at the rhetoric, the official policies, often they are expressive of a kind of hedging. For ASEAN states with these two major powers, arguably what they want is a certain balance between the two. They don't want one power, whether it's China or the US. They want to be able to pursue their own path by, to some extent, navigating between those two in a situation that gives them a degree of flexibility. And, you know, one of the issues that... That, um, it, 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 that issue is something also that Australia increasingly confronts. You know, how do we kind of navigate these rather sensitive shoals? Um, where on the one hand our traditional security alliance and has always been with the US and will continue to be, but our trade is increasingly very much and a lot of our cultural exchanges are now with Asia. And there's a, uh, an interesting tension there too, which is a little beyond what we're talking about now. So in a sense, ASEAN member states are interested in preserving a kind of dynamic equilibrium that gives them some space to um, develop and, and uh, proceed. Um, China's response has been, when dealing with ASEAN, to try and uh, insist on bilateral negotiations and to eschew entirely multilateral negotiations for reasons that are perhaps not too hard to understand. Complicating the picture even further is the role of Chinese minorities in Southeast Asian countries, in ASEAN member states. And uh, again, as anyone who knows the region and, and has uh, been reading uh, studies of the region or been working in the region knows, um, there have been long-standing concerns, and these are current, they're not they're by no means dissipated, uh, amongst many ASEAN uh, member states about the role and significance and effects of the Chinese minority within their countries. Um, particularly the disproportionate influence that Chinese minority wields over national economies. Whether it's, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but basically if you look at any of the ASEAN economies, what you see is no matter what the proportion of the Chinese um, minority, whether it's small or larger, 
they exercise a very significantly disproportionate effect on the economy. So their, their economic importance is much greater than their numbers might suggest. And for this and other reasons, there have been uh, intermittent violence practiced against uh, local Chinese minorities, the most spectacular example of which was Indonesia in 1965 when uh, an anti-communist uprising was in fact used as a, in many ways, uh, uh, an anti-Chinese campaign and, 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 well, thousands of people were killed. But Malaysia, Vietnam, um, and Vietnam of course has a particularly problematic relationship to going back over at least a millennium uh, with China. Um, this year is the 35th anniversary of the last time Vietnam and China went to war in 1979. Um, and we need also to think about the history of geopolitics in the region. ASEAN itself, founded in 1967, right in the, you know, in, in the, the latter, well, in, during the Cold War, let's say, in part founded significantly in part as a bulwark against rising communism, the so-called so communist threat in the region. Um, so Vietnam, for example, only was able to join ASEAN in 1995. Um, there's been strong anti-Chinese sentiment, which continues today to some extent in Indonesia, um, fed by perceptions that um, the Chinese minorities' loyalties were more to Beijing than to Jakarta. Um, and there is ongoing and significant discrimination um, against uh, Chinese Malaysians in terms of education and everything else, but it includes higher education. Um, another mythology that we need to dispel is that relations between China and ASEAN are relatively new. They're not at all. Um, if we go back into China's history and the history of uh, the ASEAN, what's now the ASEAN area, you can see that intra-regional trade began even before what we know as the BCE, uh, the Common Era, the inception of the Common Era. It grew during the Three Kingdoms period, particularly during the Tang Dynasty, um, the Yuan Dynasty, uh, when Kublai Khan sought to extend territory in the region, including particularly in Java. Uh, and we know that there are significant records of um, trade, um, including by some Chinese Muslims. And coming down through Thailand, Cambodia, Malay Archipelago, Java and Sumatra. And that became, uh, was heightened by a weakened government in Beijing uh, at the end, towards the end of the Ming Dynasty, which as you know, ended in 1644. So there were more opportunities to enhance that regional trade, particularly Hokkienese or Fujianese, who have always been very active um, traders. But also the reverse direction, and we know less about that, but we know that Malaysian and, well, what we'd now call Malaysian, Malay and Indonesian sailors were active in the region too. The Hindu Cham Empire of central Vietnam, which has, you know, basically disappeared, it was taken over, was, well, yes, dominated by the local Vietnamese, um, conquered. Um, but they also were quite active traders and, and voyagers. But the most well-known example is, of course, the uh, famous uh, Ming Dynasty Admiral Zheng He, whose voyages between 1405 and 1433, several voyages, um, comprised dozens of ships, uh, tens of thousands of crew, um, and extensive trade in both directions. Interestingly, and this is perhaps less well known, is that Zheng He himself was a Muslim and a eunuch, of course, um, as, as would have been, uh, as, as was common for um, uh, those at the court. Um, so he would have found some kindred spirits, fellow Muslims, of course, when uh, sailing around uh, Southeast Asia. These were relatively uh, peaceful voyages. They weren't voyages of conquest or imperialism, uh, particularly. Unfortunately, very sadly, when he returned, um, 
basically the Beijing court decided that for various reasons these were no longer of interest and all the records of those voyages were destroyed, which makes that book by Gavin Menzies even sillier than um, it, it uh, in fact was. Um, he even wrote a subsequent volume talking about Cheng He's visit to uh, the Thames and London, which was even sillier. But nonetheless, a very important um, very important episode in regional relations. So these relations that we talk about now are in fact very, very substantial and very long standing. And you can see some of those voyages here on this map. Um, and the regional uh, dimension of that. But the routes that um, we are talking about were also routes for ideas. Um, and again, these uh, connections are of very long standing poetry, astronomy, medicine, and so on, arithmetic. The whole Confucian, not just the ideas, but the whole Confucian architecture was um, exported widely through the region and very, very influential in what is now Vietnam, uh, where he's still seen, Confucius is seen as a teacher of 10,000 sovereigns. So very complex relationships here. Contacts between Buddhists in China and current ASEAN go back to the sixth century. And of course, there was contact between some of the smaller but some significant Islamic learning centers. Um, we know less about that. An important uh, further element is the influence of the Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia. And that's very influential throughout the region. The proportions, as you see here, differ widely. So tiny in Vietnam, 1.5%, 25% in Malaysia, and something like 65% or more in Singapore, of which Hokkien is the largest uh, sub-component. Language too. Um, less widely, spo widely spoken in Singapore, of course, um, less widely in, in Malaysia, uh, much less again in Vietnam. In Malaysia, the Chinese, Chinese families still want to send their kids to Chinese schools, and do. In Vietnam, however, you see all the streets are named according to generals and emperors that have been fighting against the Chinese invasion for 2,000 years. So a very, very complex uh, relationship, particularly in Vietnam. All right, so if we just summarize then, where, where does this get us to? What it shows is that it's not just economics. History matters, culture matters, ethnic ties matter, changing security allegiances and, and agreements nationalist sentiments, and again, uh, Jane raised that before. Um, political ideologies, including those of the great powers. So what was done uh, for this study then was to select three ASEAN states to examine uh, higher ed relations with China. So um, the, the dragon and then three tiger cubs. Now I deliberately chose these to get some contrast. So you have on the one hand, Singapore, by far the most developed country and something of an outlier in ASEAN, it has to be said on many uh, indices, but the most developed by far, tiny economy, uh, sorry, tiny population, as you see, in a very substantial economy, now slightly larger than Malaysia's. Malaysia with a much larger population, um, sort of middle level um, of development, and then Vietnam, a uh, significant population, um, but as you see, by far the poorest. And then of course the regional giant of China. So what we see is some really quite distinct differences between the three tiger cubs. Singapore by far the smallest, but by far the most prosperous. Its higher ed system is by far the most developed and competes very strongly against pretty much anywhere, certainly very strongly in the region. Vietnam, uh, sorry, Malaysia, middle income, um, with less financial clout, more developed infrastructure, um, now recognising mainland degrees and from Taiwan, um, set, uh, um, established diplomatic ties with China quite early and significant trade. Vietnam by far the largest in terms of population, the smallest economy and probably most dependent, well unarguably the most dependent of the three on China. So two-way relations are by no means symmetrical. And there are signs of change in all of the three, and I won't go into that. All of them are members of WTO, 
Vietnam was the last to join. Um, and as I say, there is now a China ASEAN free trade agreement that will um, further underpin more trade. We know that China ASEAN trade in educational services is growing. Not only is service sector trade in general rising throughout the region, but particularly education. And there's estimates of how uh, large that trade is. Um, as you know, uh, education was uh, designated as a service sector trade within GAS, the Global Agreement on Trade in Services. So in a sense, that enables us to track it better. I'm not in any sense a supporter of um, seeing education as a service sector trade, but it does have some analytical value in enabling us to track flows in some ways uh, more specifically. And we know that trade in higher ed services is rising faster in Asia. Um, you get some idea there of total US earnings from higher education, the United Kingdom um, and Australia. China, we don't know. China is now a significant host for international students. Well over 300,000 students are studying in China, many of them from Asia, numbers of them supported by scholarships. China is quite generous with scholarships, particularly to regional neighbours. Um, we don't know, in fact, how much China earns, and one of my other projects is to try and find out. Um, Singapore, quite high, but of course, being Singapore, they're not telling anyone. Um, and Malaysia's is expanding rapidly, um, and, and not just regionally. I don't have time to go into that, but they're also projecting themselves in the Middle East as a Muslim, you know, Centre for Muslim Scholarship. So, um, if we look at ASEAN in particular, and the Shanghai Jiao Tung uh, rating, which we've been talking about uh, over the last couple of days, other than Singapore, virtually no representation uh, of ASEAN. Uh, universities. But there are now something like 34 Chinese universities on that index. Compare that with the other regional giant, India, which has, I think, three, just to give you some idea. Um, so we need to think about China's intellectual rise, China's rise as a centre for scholarship, research and um, uh, scientific production. It's uneven, it's, it's uh, we've done some work on this. Um, the rise is, is spectacular, probably more in quantitative than in qualitative terms, but we need to pay much more attention to it than we have been. Singapore has invested um, heavily and strategically in higher education and in R&D. It aspires to be, as it calls itself, the Boston of the East. Um, it's about the same size, in fact, a little bit bigger, but not much. Um, and with some success. It's been uneven, again, some of the uh, uh, partnerships haven't endured, but nonetheless, it is now uh, very active and, and uh, seeking to project itself uh, more and more. Malaysia, too, is ambitious. Weaker infrastructure, of course, relative to Singapore. They've developed some apex universities um, with expectations that they should rise into the top 100 or even the top 50 by 2020. You know, politicians are very fond of this. You know, we'll give you some money, but you've got to be top 50 with them by next weekend um, on some <laughs> ranking uh, or other. Um, of course, uh, Vietnam is the weakest higher education system in the region. It, in fact, is using internationalization as a means to um, enhance quality within the system. So it's developing what it, developing what it calls model universities. Um, and you see there that one of these is a Vietnamese German university. Um, I spoke to members of the foreign, uh, the, the foreign affairs, uh, foreign affairs officials here in Germany a couple of some years ago, and they were saying this just came out of nowhere. Um, it wasn't particularly well planned or anything. It was simply an edict that came down from on high, and they, because others were founding universities in 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 Vietnam, uh, Germany needed to have one too, and say, hey, presto, we have a Vietnamese German university. Um, but also another with France, another with uh, America, and so on. And of course, the most, the most, the largest and most well-established has been RMIT, which has been there for a long time, from Melbourne, Australia. So, um, China ASEAN relations in higher education occur within that very wide, long-standing, and complicated and evolving context. It, it includes framework agreements, trade relations, and so on and as I said, a very dynamic history and set of cultures and international relations. Um, 
There are some framework agreements which are of significance when we need to understand this. Um, includes ASE, the AUN, which now is, includes ASEAN plus three. Um, APRU, the Asia Pacific Research University Network, which includes some uh, members from China, but not yet from uh, China, Singapore, Malaysia, but not yet Vietnam. Universitas 21 and so on. And as you see here, there is also some framework agreements about to, to underpin further growth in international student enrolments in both directions. 100,000 students <coughs> in each direction by 2020, according to the Guiyang Declaration of 2010. Um, so here we see, here is where I've tried to use the four GATS modes of, of trade. Not that I'm endorsing it, this is simply analytically useful and then tried to map the specific relations between China and ASEAN. Um, so these are the four uh, modes, and I won't go into them here, but what we see um, is that there are significant differences, and I'll show the, uh, uh, the um, <coughs> graphic in a minute. There are significant differences within uh, Asia and within these three in a context where in Asia hierarchy is very important um, particularly in China but, but more broadly. So basically Singapore has the most substantial relations based on some very firm and well established pillars. Malaysia's middle income status puts it in a relatively mid position and Vietnam's um, weaker economic position and particularly complex relationship with China puts it in uh, a, a more dependent situation. So here we see the specific um, relations and partnerships between China and ASEAN. Um, so the italicized versions here, for example, and there, these uh, represent Chinese exports um, and the non-italicized uh, are Chinese imports. Um, so you see that, um, even just briefly, you can see that the modes of partnership are quite dense in Singapore, um, less so in Malaysia, and there's an additional factor there that the private sector has been more active than the public, um, and a more dependent relationship in relation to Vietnam. So what we see is hierarchy. Um, even if we look at different uh, Chinese universities, there's a world of difference between, for example, Tsinghua, sometimes called China's MIT, one of its two leading universities and, and very, very active and dynamic and, and uh, rising rapidly, and say, Guangxi University, an important regional university, but right down on Vietnam's borders, a much more limited and regional impact. So, in conclusion, um, hierarchy and stratification are important when considering this relationship of China ASEAN higher education relations. History, politics, culture, language, and the role of the Chinese diaspora are all also important. Ethnic discrimination against Chinese minorities, in the case of Malaysia against non Bumi Putras, which, of which the Chinese are a major example. Um, but also, as I said, we need to take into account the more dynamic. Um, uh, the more dynamic perspective or the more dynamic stance of the private sector in Malaysia than the public, which is more hidebound. Um, we need to know a lot more about this. I, I'm, I'm only you know, tracing uh, many of these things, but in much of the detail remains for us yet to discover in terms of income, in terms of forms and extent of mobility, including some of the quiet achievers, some of the border relations which are really important and often of long standing but much, much less well known. Um, there is, interestingly, I think, um, and I, I, I think it's important to emphasise this, there's significant potential for growth in China as in higher ed relations, despite all these complex historical relations, despite the current territorial disputes in the South China Sea and so on. We can still manage to make them work, and indeed they are. It's also important to, and this refers back to the character of regionalism that came up yesterday, I think, when we were talking about um, the European higher education area and some of the architecture that surrounds it. Well, ASEAN is, looks to uh, Europe as a kind of model in this respect. But it has to be said, 
the quality of ASEAN regionalism is much more embryonic than it is uh, here in, in Europe, and that includes the um, architecture to support uh, regionalism in higher education. It's growing, There's, it's very ambitious, but it is certainly not yet at anything like the level that exists here in Europe. Lastly, um, does the fact that we can see such growth in China ASEAN regionalism, including intra-regional student staff and program mobility, and again, uh, Jane raised that in her presentation earlier, does that mean that we now need to think about China ASEAN as a region? Even to think of ASEAN as a region is something of a challenge given the diversity, but there is some, you know, some sense that we can understand ASEAN as a region. But do we perhaps need to think or consider the possibility of China ASEAN as perhaps a region? And if so, what are the implications of that, both for universities in China and in ASEAN, and for how we understand higher education as a field? I'll leave it at that.